police amateur video, smuggled out of Burma, recorded the last public appearance by charismatic opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi. <laughs> In May last year, after she'd been released from house arrest, she went on the road to speak with her followers. It was a massive display of support for her party, the National League for Democracy. Shortly after giving this speech, Aung San Suu Kyi and her supporters were attacked, and she was once again placed under house arrest. But it's another recent blow that poses an equally serious threat to her movement. Burma's only other significant opposition group has recently broken ranks with Aung San Suu Kyi by negotiating with the country's military rulers. way to meet what remains of one of the most formidable rebel armies in Southeast Asia. To reach the Karen 202 Battalion Camp, I'm taken into Burma along the Moi River, which marks the border with Thailand. Ethnic Karen have been fighting the Burmese government for more than 50 years and control strategic pockets of territory on the Thai border. Apart from crossing over from Thailand, there are only two ways into this camp and both of these are landmined. As night falls, more fighters emerge. Next morning, it's target practice. We're three kilometres from the front line. The last skirmish took place just days before I arrived, within sight of this camp. Shakalu is a major in the Karen National Liberation Army. Here one shot, here one, here one, here one, and up here one. Well, I consider myself, I'm a freedom fighter because I need my place, I need my country, I want my people to be free. So I fight for my Korean people. So I consider that I'm a freedom fighter. But after decades of war, Burma's generals have finally begun talking with their oldest foe. Last month, as part of its so-called Roadmap to Democracy, the regime invited the Karen to Rangoon to hold talks on a ceasefire agreement. Led by this man, General Bonia, the talks represented a historic breakthrough in Southeast Asia's longest-running civil war. General Bamiya has now returned from what was his first visit to Rangoon since 1947. Today he's the guest of honour at the 55th anniversary of the Karen's battle for independence. The Karen are the only armed ethnic group never to have surrendered or signed a permanent ceasefire with Burma's military rulers. His son, Colonel Nadar, 
says the Quran have four key demands. Number one is uh, surrender is out of question. Number two, we will retain our arms. Number three, Quran state must be recognized, must be complete. And uh, number four, we will decide our own political destiny. The Korean know they're doing a deal with the devil, but they are prepared to drop demands for full independence if Burma's generals leave them alone. Saying we want a genuine federation system in Burma doesn't mean that we have to separate ourselves, but we can have a self-governing in our state. We can also join hands with federal union, genuine federal union. 20-year-old Mong La is one of thousands of ordinary Karen villagers who have long been caught in the middle of this conflict. After treading on a landmine, he travelled for two days to get to this clinic across the border in northern Thailand. What's left of his foot is about to be cut off. So he's had an injection in his spine in simple mm. terms. Mm. He's awake though. Yes. He is going to know what's happening throughout? No, he won't be able to see what's happening. If he sits up, we'll put him down again. I mean, he won't be able to see what's happening. Yeah. There? See that? Here. No? 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 So it You have it? Medical care is all but non-existent inside Burma's frontline regions. And even here, the conditions are pretty basic. Would you tell him that I'm sorry that we had to take his leg off? Incredible as it sounds, Mong La knows that if he returns to Burma, he will have to pay the military for damaging government property. <laughs> Despite everything the Karen have suffered, they've never wavered in their resistance to the Burmese regime. Now, for the first time, they're being offered a settlement that doesn't demand their surrender. But getting the Karen to sign onto a ceasefire would be a big victory for Burma's generals. Not just because it helps legitimise the regime, but also because it further isolates Burma's most popular opposition leader. When Aung San Suu Kyi addressed supporters last May, her words resonated amongst a people desperate for change. Despite years of house arrest and the continued detention and torture of the leaders of her party, Aung San Suu Kyi's support seems stronger than ever. But the brutality that followed was evidence that the military regime shows no sign of tolerating dissent. The government was closely monitoring the ever-increasing crowds and on the night of May the 30th, in the small town of Depayen, the triumphant tour came to a violent end. The government says that as night fell, four people were killed in a clash between Aung San Suu Kyi's supporters and other opposition groups. But eyewitnesses say that pro-government thugs murdered up to 100 people and jailed countless more. Aung San Suu Kyi herself was returned to house arrest. The National League for Democracy calls the events of that night the Depayin Massacre. I think there's 
no doubt that, that the, the, the purpose um, of what took place on, on 30th of May was, was to stop it, you know, before it, 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 it grew uh, any bigger. Burma-based academic Morton Patterson from the Australian National University says what took place was entirely predictable. Yes, I think they were getting worried um, that he uh, was on a sort of a long march, uh, march uh, and, you know, she would travel back to Yangon with, with thousands and thousands of people sort of uh, coming along and then maybe having similar crowds. Win Win, not his real name, was present when the attack occurred. He was part of Aung San Suu Kyi's security team. He has since fled to Thailand, and in his first ever television interview, he says the attack was premeditated. I am a Dortua, whose name has also been changed for her family's safety, was another eyewitness. She was standing next to Aung San Suu Kyi's car when the attackers struck. ပင်နေကျွန်တော်တို့ယူနီဖောင်းပင်နေပါတယ်ရောက်ကြားမေးမှာပင်နေပါတယ်အဲ့ပင်နေတို့တအားမုန်းနဲ့သူတို့ပင
there has to be a change. She cannot do much, so we have to find many ways. We have to use new tactics to achieve our goal. There is also, uh, you know, I think a, a case for taking a more pragmatic view on the situation here and, and everywhere else. If you cannot get what you want, should you perhaps not accept 80, 70, 60, 50 percent? Where does the line go? That's up to the individual. The Korean believe there are two issues at stake in this conflict. One is democracy, the other the rights of Burma's ethnic groups. The colonel refuses to concede that the Karen have sidelined Aung San Suu Kyi by deciding to deal directly with the regime. If you are Aung San Suu Kyi, would you be upset? If I, if I were her, I wouldn't be upset with the Karen. But haven't you basically sold her out by dealing directly with the military? No, even in the past, we... She's a, she's a symbol for democracy, but she's not our leader. Our leader, we have our current leader who trying to achieve the freedom and democracy, no, freedom and self-determination and rights for the equality for, for the current people. We have to listen to our leader. Burma has long been considered a pariah state. The military regime has now accelerated its campaign to sign up ethnic groups to a so-called peace process. And for many governments, this will lessen the pressure to talk tough with Burma. But for ordinary Burmese, there's no sign of improvement on the horizon.